50 years, his band has sold more than 11 and a half million albums. They're a major international rock act, but they don't tear up hotel rooms or do drugs. Instead, they fight passionately for the things that they believe in. Putting his money where his mouth is, their lead singer is proud to be patron of the Australian Conservation Foundation. Please welcome to Midday, Peter Garrett. <laughs> Welcome to Midday, Peter. Thanks, Kerry ann Well, Peter, last week in the Northern Territory, Midnight Oil did a, uh, a concert with a very strong message. What was it? We played up on a blockade that's happening in Kakadu National mm -hmm. Park, where a very big uranium mine is being planned. We played with uh, Coloured Stone and Aboriginal Band with Regurgitator, and we got ourselves right onto the site of the lease where one of the largest deposits of uranium exists now. We played at about 7.15 in the morning, which was the earliest that we've ever played, but it was a way of drawing Australians' attention to what's going on there, encouraging young Australians to come up onto the blockade and showing our solidarity, both with the traditional owners of this area who don't want this mine to go ahead, but also a consistent thing for the oils over the years. We love this country. We really want to look after it. Another opinion would be, Peter, that if we don't mine that uranium, it will cost the country dearly in terms of billions of dollars and jobs, uh, which really turn us into the lucky country. What's your response? I think Australians have really got to make up their minds whether they want their governments to advance uranium mining as the solution to our economic problems or not. And I think there are some questions as to whether it could do that. The big question for us is in, that uranium mining <laughs> produces substances which stay with us for such a long period of time, radioactive substances. This is in the middle of our prestigious national park, Kakadu, the best, the biggest, the most important park that we have. Now, in actual fact, Australia generates more income and more jobs from sharing our natural and our cultural resources with the rest of the world than it does from any other activity. We're employing young Australians to share the beauty of this country through tourism. And I think for us, the sums involved aren't that large. Uh, the jobs involved aren't that great in number. I mean, there was a billion dollars that, uh, that came about from the sale of one third of Telstra, which was going into a heritage fund. We could ask ourselves where that money went. But I think for us as Australians, we've got to ask ourselves, do we want sustainable industries? Or do we want industries like uranium mining, which have got very serious health and environmental risks? But it is still legal. Um, where, do, where does uranium go? Well, it goes to a couple of places. It goes to uh, producing nuclear power for electricity, provision of electricity, and it goes into nuclear weapons. Well, let's look at the, the power issue then. Uh, what is, uh, clearly you wouldn't be believing in uh, nuclear power, what is your alternative to, uh, to the world's problems when we're burning up fossil fuels, which is creating the greenhouse effect, they say? kerri this is the most important question. This is where sustainable energy comes in. I mean, you think about Australia with the greatest supply of free energy called solar energy that the world has known. I mean, we've reached the stage with the technologies of things like solar e energy where we can actually start producing energy from the sun and using it to heat our cells, to light up our but homes. But have we, so or, or is it just sort of still minuscule? No, no look, we're it. there. We're absolutely there. And I mean, I think the, the frustrating thing for someone like me is having talked about this issue for years and now finding that the technological innovation on solar has arrived, that it hasn't got the support of governments. I mean, one of the most incredible things is that we led the world from the CSIRO and from the University of New South Wales, we led the world in solar research. I mean, look at those cars that we see on television that, that run from Alice Springs, I think, down to Adelaide, they go. They're solar-powered cars. Look at solar hot water systems. Look at the fact that now the, the cells in solar systems can hold on to electricity for much longer than they can. The technology is there. What isn't there is the political will. But they're one single little cars containing one person lying very flat, going very slowly for a long period of oh, time. Oh, yeah, but with one little solar cell on top of them. I mean, the fact that really the, the situation has been reached now where with renewables like solar, particularly in Australia mm -hmm. and those countries which have got good access to sunlight, but also renewables like biothermal, like natural gas, which isn't a renewable, which is a, a safe form of energy, with wind, we're seeing these investments happen all over Europe, all through the United States, and we'll continue to see it. I mean, there's no future for the world in producing a poisonous substance to give itself energy. I mean, but the that's rest what... of the world is doing it. Well, and not... that, is that 
is no, what I, they are I, calling new technology. No, I don't agree with that, Kerri Ann. I don't think the rest of the world is. I think what's happening is that particularly the European nations, particularly Western European nations, the United States, have sworn themselves off nuclear. They've realised A, it's too expensive, B, it poses too many problems for health, C, it lasts too long. I mean, you and I, Mr Howard, Mr Beasley, no one can guarantee that a site like Kakadu will be looked after for 100,000 years. We can't do it. Okay, you were also up there in part of the concert, I understand. It was uh, for Aboriginal land rights. Yes. Let's um, run a hypothetical here. Uh, you're in charge of uh, reconciliation for Australia. What does uh, Peter Garrett do? Gosh, Kerry ann you've really put me on the spot. Well, look, the first thing I would do is I would say that our history and our law have got to come into sync. We had decisions from the High Court with Mabo and Wick, and those decisions said that Aboriginal people did have some rights over land. So I would honour those decisions. I wouldn't try and knock those decisions off. And if you do go back and read the cases, you'll find that the judges thought it through quite carefully. The next thing that I'd do is I'd get rid of the 10-point plan because nobody's happy with it. It's not going to work and it's going to be a recipe for, I think, disgruntlement in the community. I don't think anybody really understands what it is. Well, it's a very complex issue. The next thing that I'd do is I'd bring the parties together and insist that regional agreements on a case-by-case -case basis are entered into. But and we already, that, ha we already have examples uh, of what land claims are supposed to be doing? There, la lots of land claims are going to, uh, to the courts and of course the result of that is um, uh, freehold can't be taken away from people but in terms of lease land claims are made, a lot of them are, but because we had Noel Pearson here a few yes. weeks ago discussing it. Yes. So we have farmers who traditionally do it tough every year anyway in this country having to find cash to fight in court against a land claim on their property. What is the answer there? Well, I, look, I believe that the government ought to be, assist the process and it ought to assist both sides. Mm -hmm. I think as far as Amber claims are concerned, Amber claims will get ruled out in time. I think what's actually happening is that where you've got Aboriginal people and the stakeholders mm -hmm. at the time sitting down, quite often outside of the political process, Century Mine, mm -hmm. the Cape York Agreements, the agreements in South Australia, you see things move onwards. I mean, we've got gold mines in the Tanami Desert. Uh, where mining companies and Aboriginal people are having no problems getting on with one another and reaching agreements about what should go forward. I think it can be done. Well, I was about to ask you if you thought there was any such thing as a responsible mining company. Well, there are, and I think that mining practices are basically improving over time. But really, for us Australians, it's a question of our own culture as well. And that is, do we see the country as a quarry? Because once it's dug up, We've still got to deal with the legacies of it. We've still got to clean up the sites. We've got to consider that this is the right use of our land. Now, in some instances, it definitely is. But with things like uranium mining, I think there's a very real question that what we'll end up doing is creating a big pollution well in the centre of Australia, which our kids and our kids and the people that go on caravans and people that go out on school expeditions, they'll all have to encounter that. And I think that's a terribly high price to pay. Whatever happened to the uh, nuclear disarmament party back in the 80s? Well, one of them went back into a rock and roll band. <laughs> uh, I think some of the people that were involved, Joe Valentine ended up serving in the Senate. Many of them have ended up working in different community groups and going off and following their careers. Does that, is that really saying to us that uh, Australia lost interest in you? Not you personally, but oh. in nuclear disarmament. I think that people felt that the arguments had been well put. And to be perfectly mm. honest, I think that people had felt that we'd ruled out nuclear as an option. I mean, the NDP succeeded in getting tremendously large numbers of Australians focused on this issue and showing their concern about it. And we saw some response from political mm. parties and from government. But what's happened in the, in the ensuing 10 years, uh, particularly under a Conservative government, I'd have to say, is that the option of nuclear raises its head again. And I think for Australians, there's, there's not necessarily a need to have a party like that again, but I think the issues come back onto the agenda. Well, you were so close in 84 to the Senate. Yes. Would you stand again? Well, I don't know. I mean, I haven't given a great deal of thought. There's a possibility that I would if the circumstances were right. And I'm not sort of umming and ahhing about it. I really felt that I wanted these issues to be discussed honestly and openly. I felt if we had any chance as Australians to do that, but isn't it then time that would to be do a good that step. Again now, well, it may be, but uh, for the moment I'm busy. I'm making records and uh, I'm campaigning on uranium. So. OK. Well, I'll get to the record in just a second. But you love, you know, you never shy away from the big issues. No. Uh, may I ask you about the warfare's dispute? How would you handle it? Well, once again, I don't think I'm the person that gets put in the chair to say how I would handle it, but I'd be happy to say what I think about it. Uh, I think that the right to organise uh, into labour is a fundamental democratic right. And I think that any government or any group of people who want to put people outside of that right, even though it's entrenched in their own legislation, have made a mistake. But I don't defend rorts and bad practices. They exist. They should be worked through. But 
Unfortunately, what the Wharfies dispute does is it forces most Australians to say, well, look, I really think that we should get the waterfront in order, but I actually don't like the idea of 1,400 people, some of whom were actually working to best practice and probably weren't, and we know weren't rorting, mm. getting put out of work. So when I get to jump on the line, I jump down on the side of the Wharfies. Mm. You haven't got an easy answer to fix it? Well, I think, there's a sh I think there are long-term answers mm. to fixing it. I think that really the government has got to come in, got to come back into the dispute as an independent party. Mm. And I honestly believe, and I mean this is a complex issue, but I honestly believe that we had a good arbitration system. It didn't deliver the perfect results for everybody, but it's the Australian arbitration system gave us peace. In but effect. the fact that it's a monopoly on the wars is one of the things that makes it difficult. It is difficult, but by the same token, I think that there's I mean, room... a monopoly never works because, I mean, I'm in the business, uh, if, if people don't like it, you're out. If people don't like you, they don't buy your records and you're out of business. We're not in, uh, you know, we're not in a, a monopoly business. No, there's plenty of other people writing pop songs and rock mm. songs, that's true. But I think the issue about the waterfront is that we had in existence a system which permitted peaceful resolution of dispute. Now, it may not have been to everybody's advantage mm. at every step along the way, but basically, I mean, there's a lot of give and take in this issue, but to, go, to do away with that issue, I mean, we've basically done away with arbitration, we've introduced new legislation into the parliament, and then we've then seen the government come down on the side of Patrick's. We've seen Patrick's basically take away its legal responsibilities by putting them into hands mm. of companies that have, haven't got any money. I think that probably sets a bad precedent for most Australians. I say that there was a system there which, though imperfect, worked mm. to the best of our advantage. I don't think we should have thrown it out. Well, the best question of all, what is Peter Garrett working on now in the oils? When, uh, is, the, when is the album When's out? the next record? Yeah, Carrie Ann, it's taken us 12 months, but uh, Martin Rotzi and Jim Eugenie, who play guitar in the band, have just gone to London to mix the record. And I think it'll be re so released. So it's in some the can. Yeah, we've it's done, done it. Yeah, we've spent the last year working in studios, both in Sydney and Melbourne. Release date? Uh, let's say sometime in June. Touring sometime July and August. Fabulous. I know Australia. Everybody's been asking. Just ask me. Forget all the other stuff with Peter and <laughs> conservation. We just want to know about the album. Yeah. Well, there you go. You got the answers. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks we really for having appreciate me. your time. By the way, <laughs> must mention. Uh, Peter is patron of the Australian Conservation Foundation. There's uh, information there, 1800 number. If you would like to get involved, uh, please feel free to call 1800 332 510. And we do appreciate your time. Peter Garrett.